Good morning. Go ahead and find a seat. Uh, it is good to gather this morning as the body of Christ to worship our Lord and Savior, to remember the resurrection on this, uh, this day of the week, the first day of the week. So we are glad you're here to worship with us this morning. If you're here for the first time, thank you for joining us. And there is a card um, on the little podiums over there. And if you'll fill one of those out for us, we would love to thank you for being with us. And you can take that to the Welcome Center, and we have a gift we'd like to give you. So fill that out for us, and uh, we would appreciate that. Also, please um, realize that uh, those connection cards are to be used by anybody that just wants to communicate with us. So if you want to fill out a prayer request on there or let us know something else, please use those cards. I mean, you can always just walk up and talk to us, but if you'd rather just fill out a card, and then we pray for those things during the week and so we can pray specifically for you. Okay? So please do that for us. Now, I want to let you know of a few things that are coming up. Um, and we like to talk about gospeling opportunities, opportunities that you have to speak the good news, uh, to share the good news of Jesus Christ with friends. And one of the things that we've brought back is uh, last year we, in our advance on Wednesday night, we talked about advancing in your witness. And as an encouragement to that, we had um, these windows put together. Danny Stone did that for us. And the windows have three things on them. They say gospel prayer, gospel friendship, and gospel conversation. And the idea with that is, is gospel prayer is somebody that you are praying for that they would come to faith in Jesus Christ. And gospel friendship is somebody that you are seeking to grow in friendship with, knowing that, you, that they are not believers and you want to share the gospel with them. So that may be a friend or a family member, I'm sorry, not a family, hopefully your friend, friends with your family members, a neighbor, a co-worker, but somebody that you're just trying to build that relationship with so that you can have some good gospel conversations with. And then the last one is gospel conversations. And so the windows are there just to remind you that as you look out the windows of your house, there is a lost world out there, and we need to be faithful in sharing the gospel with them. So the windows are there to remind you, and then if you would, uh, hopefully as I went through that, somebody popped into your mind. There are dry erase markers there, and if you would just write your, their name on on that, wherever that app, if it's somebody you're praying for, if it's somebody that uh, you're trying to grow in friendship with, or if it's somebody that you're having gospel conversations with, write their names on there, and then that's just an encouragement to all of us, and it's that reminder that we all have lost people that we're praying for, and then um, we will pray for those people uh, as people see those names. So please do that and just be aware of, of opportunities. So a few opportunities that are coming up uh, to spread the gospel. One is Halloween is coming up on October 31st. And one of the things uh, we're going to do, we did this last year, is we've ordered 1,500 finger lights. And we'll have those hopefully next week if they arrive when they're supposed to. Um, and those are just uh, lights that, little, that children can slip on their fingers, and we want you just to make use of those in any way that you would like to. During Halloween, we as a family just handed those out um, instead of candy, and the kids loved it. Uh, I know last year, a lady in the church, she wasn't going to be home on Halloween night, so as she saw kids in the week in, before in her, neighborhood, in her neighborhood, she would just walk up and say, hey, I have a, a light for you for Halloween, and it has the name of the church on the side, and just um, hopefully it will give you some opportunities to share the gospel. Another thing coming up is our men's breakfast, November 19th, and our guest speaker is going to be uh, Bobby Evans, who is the former general manager of the San Francisco Giants, and um, so he'll be with us here, a great believer, member of uh, First Baptist of San Francisco, and so um, please put that on your calendar if you're a man and invite your friends. It'll be a lot of fun, and then um, the last thing is just we want to remind you that the holidays are coming up. And as you think about Thanksgiving and Christmas and all of that, just look for those opportunities to be intentional in sharing the gospel. Okay? So those are the things we wanted to have for you. Um, one thing we want to recognize tonight, or this morning, is uh, we like to recognize fifth anniversary. So Gary and Carrie Norton uh, are celebrating their 15th anniversary. You guys were like little babies. So young. Um, so congratulations, uh, and we like to just celebrate the five. So uh, if you see Gary and Carrie, make sure to say congratulations to them. And now uh, Mike McCall is going to come and has something to share with you. Well, good morning. Um, some of you may know that October is when we have our pastor appreciation. I want you to remember how blessed Woodward Park is. Um, our church is blessed with godly, hardworking, 
generous, kind, gifted, and capable pastors. He showered us with their love as they've cared and given themselves away in service to our church. So I'd like to ask Rick and Craig and Connor if you would come up to the stage, please. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving your lives away in service to our Lord and in service to this church. Um, we have a little gift for you. Um, it's small compared to what you do for us, how you love our church, how you love each of us, and it makes a difference. So thank you very much. Rick. And and, and let me remind you um, that they have wives and family that stand beside them and, and how much we appreciate them. So ladies, thank you so much for what you do in lifting your husband and your family and caring for them, and we love you too. Now... Um, the pastor leadership team wants to give you an opportunity to express your appreciation um, to our pastors as well. So um, we're going to ask you, if you would, to consider uh, writing them a note, um, a text, an email, a phone call, a letter, a conversation. Um, find a way just to express your appreciation. Tell them a story of how they've made a difference in your life and a difference in our church. And when you write that note, also think about a way that maybe in a tangible way you can say thank you. Um, maybe it's a personalized gift that you can give. Um, it might be inviting them into your home for dinner or taking them to dinner or to lunch. It might mean um, a gift card or something that you think that they would enjoy or find some way in your own heart, in your own life, your own way of expressing to them your appreciation. And tomorrow morning or tomorrow sometime, you will receive an email that will explain all of this and help you understand and remind you that we too, as individuals, can express our appreciation to our pastors. So once again, pastors, we love you. And we thank you so much for loving us and for loving God and for always leading us in his word. We appreciate that so much. Blessings to you all. Thank you. Good morning. I'm going to share some verses uh, with you today as our call for worship. Um, I don't know how you guys feel when you come here in the mornings, um, but when I enter this building, I feel s safety. I feel rest. I feel peace. And, um, and it's because of God's God's word that's shared here, it's a safe place. But we could have that safe place outside of here. But anyways, um, I'm reminded of the verses, a couple verses. I'm going to first read to you from Hebrews 4. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with all your weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. And then in Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, 
for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Lord, I pray today that you just help us to look to you. I I pray that you help us to um, just give you thanks, that we worship you, Lord, that we praise you, and that we rest upon you, Lord. I thank you that you do give us a place here on this corner that we can, can come and express our love for you. But I also pray, Lord, that you would help us um, as we go out from here to share with others so they could have that peace as well, Lord. Let that be your call to worship today. Amen. Amen. Well, would you stand with us as we worship together as a church this morning? scripture reading this morning is Psalm 35, verses 1 through 10. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and rise for my help. 
draw the spear and javelin against my pursuers. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let them be put to shame and dishonor who seek after my life. Let them be turned back and disappointed who, de who devise evil against me. Let them be like chaff before the wind with the angel of the Lord driving them away. Let their way be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. For without cause, they bid their net for me. Without cause, they dug a pit for my life. Let destruction come upon him when he does not know it. And let the net that he hid ensnare him. Let him fall into it to his destruction. Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exalting his salvation. All my bones shall say, O Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him, the poor and needy from him who robs him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and evermore shall be, world without end. Amen. Let us pray. We praise you, O God. We acclaim you as Lord. All creation worships you, the Father everlasting. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, the cherubim and the seraphim, sing in endless praise, Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. All glory and excellencies to your name, O God of creation, Father of light. Lord, we come before you thankful this morning. We thank you for the many blessings you've given us. One of those is, Lord, the, the beauty of creation. Lord, we're so thankful for the coolness which follows the heat of summer. Lord, we thank you for the care and the protection that you care for the world with. Lord, all the refreshment that we have from the seasons, all the sustenance that we have, the food and the water that we have is a blessing from the land that you bless. Lord, we, we are thankful for these blessings. We know they come only from your hands and only from your grace and your love. So, Lord, we're so thankful for the creation that you've given us. Lord, we're thankful also for the saints that are around us this morning. Lord, we bless you and we thank you for our brothers and our sisters who are so gracious and kind to us. Lord, what an excellent family we have in this room. Lord, we're so thankful for the redemption that we all have through the blood of your lamb. And Lord, we're thankful for the love and encouragement and the hope that each of our brothers and sisters around us brings to us. And Lord, we're thankful for these many blessings, but we also come to you as needy children. And one of our great needs, Lord, is, is for the salvation of our biological families. Lord, I know that there are many of us who have family members who are lost and are wayward. And Lord, we ask this morning that you would save them. Lord, we pray for all of the parents and siblings and children who don't know you. Lord, we ask that you would call them to your kingdom, pluck them from the path of destruction, and plant their feet on the path of life which leads to you. Lord, use us as gospel lights in their life. Give us wisdom and discernment in knowing how we can love them and point them towards your eternal kingdom. Lord, we know that you love to forgive and show mercy. So we ask for these brothers and sisters, these parents and children, we ask that they would repent and trust in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Lord, we ask this for the sake of your matchless name and your eternal glory. And Lord, as we continue to worship this morning, we ask that you would open our hearts to you, that you would shine your grace and your love into our lives Lord, we ask that you would open our ears so that we would hear your word preached. Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts so that we would come to know you more. Open our lips and we will sing forth your praise eternal. God bless the rest of our worship this morning. We ask these things in your precious name. Amen. <clears throat>
Would you guys stand with us as we continue in worship? We're going to sing a song we introduced a couple weeks ago. And this is a song that really is just so applicable in any season of life. Some of the lyrics in this are whether in life or pain, whether in life or death, whether in joy or pain, I know this truth remains that this is the day you've made. This is a day that we come to worship God. Wherever you are, it's a command to, to give a, an offering of praise to God. So I pray that you can just find solace, whether you're on a mountain peak or a valley low this morning, that this is the day that the Lord has made and we can rejoice and be glad in it. So let's sing together. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in Thank you. 
the sun will shine, whether the skies will rain. I know that you are good, and this is the day you
You can be seated. And also, first through third graders, you guys are dismissed to Adventure Club. Great singing. Uh, open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 2 as we continue our look at the letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. And uh, we know that Paul wrote this letter for Timothy, guiding him, giving him instruction, and in leading the church. And the letter is written for God's glory and the good of the church. It is um, in following these things that, that Timmy, Timothy and the church will glorify God, and it's in following these things that the church will have what is best. And as we come to today's uh, passage, chapter 2, Paul's going to talk about worshiping well. How do we worship well? How do we live life together? So let me just remind you of where we've been, some of the key verses in chapter 1. Um, in chapter 1, verse 3, there was the charge that Paul gave to Timothy to... Um, there was chaos in the church, and Paul is charged to... Um, given the charge to tell certain persons to stop teaching different doctrine. Um, in verse 5, we see his leadership style. As Paul says, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So as Timothy leads the church and lays all of this out, the goal and the aim, the style that he is to lead with, is with love. He's not to be a dictator or a tyrant. He's not to put together an, an oligarchy um, or anything like that. He's to lead through love, and that's, the, that's how Jesus led. That's the, uh, the example we have in Jesus Christ, if you look at Philippians chapter 2. And then in verse 15, we're reminded that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. That is why Jesus came, and that is the gospel that is to be preached. That is the gospel. That is the truth in which the church stands. That is our foundation, and that's the thing that unites us in Christ is if you've come and you're a part of this church, if you're part of the church universal, you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And then in verse 18, he's told to wage the good warfare. He's to guard the church from those that are trying to shipwreck people's faith from the false teachers. Timothy is to wage the good warfare. And then as we come to chapter 2 and 3, Timothy or Paul is going to write to Timothy about how worship is to happen, how we are going to live together, and then in chapter 3, who leads? What is the leadership of the church to look like? So today we come to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I'll read verses 1 through 15. Paul writes, First of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that they may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in the faith and love and holiness with self-control. This is God's word. It is perfect and holy. Let's pray. God, we pray that as we look at your word this morning that we would grow in our love for you. We would grow in our love and care for one another. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. The first thing that Paul talks about in this chapter is the importance of, of prayer. Prayer should be a part of our everyday life. So Paul starts out, he says, first of all then, and, and Paul is trying to tie what he is about to say to everything that has come before. He's not beginning a new section. He's building on what has already been said. And he says that, I urge. 
And so this is Paul giving Timothy a, an instruction. This is what I want you to do. This is what you need to be doing. He says, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. And these are overlapping descriptions of what prayer looks like. That you can split hairs and define them. They're a little bit different things. But overall, this is what prayer is. Supplication is a request. An intercession is speaking on or behalf of someone else. Thanksgiving is, is giving thanks. But, but prayer involves all of those things, and sometimes they cross over and, and wind themselves together. But prayer is to be the thing that we are about, and, the, and it's to be a regular part of the Christian's life, and it's to be a main part of what we do when we gather together. Prayer is to be a regular part of the leadership of the church. This is not something that Paul says to Timothy, you have the church do this, but this is something we are all to be doing together. And who are we to pray for? He says that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. This does not mean that you get a list of everyone in the state of California and then begin praying your way through there. I was going to say get, a, get the white pages, but I don't think those actually exist anymore. But it's not that you just get and you, you pray for people you don't know, but it's more the idea that when somebody pops into your mind, there should not be anybody that you're like, I can't pray for them. But that, that happens sometimes because of frustrations or anger, right? Whoever comes up, we, you should be willing to pray for all people. There's nobody that should be outside of the bounds of who you're going to pray for. And then I think Paul knows people's hearts because he says in verse 2, for kings and all who are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Sometimes the hardest people to pray for are your, are your leaders, right? We don't have a king. We have president, governors, mayors. We, it's easy to pray for them when we like them. But are you willing to pray for them when you don't like them? How should we be involved in politics? First and foremost, you pray. You pray for them. Every king rules under the authority of the king and kings, of the king of kings and lord of lords, and we should pray that they would lead in a way that demonstrates the wisdom of God. And just to be, a, you, they're not going to do that if they don't know Christ. So first and foremost, pray for their salvation. And then pray that they would lead well. And why? So he says that we're, why, why do we pray this way? It says that we're to pray for kings and all who are in high position, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. So it's not that we pray just so that we can be comfortable. God, I hope that the president and governor make wise decisions so that my life is easier, so that gas is cheaper. We want to leave, lead a peaceful and quiet life so that we can share the gospel. That's the primary thing that is in, in view here. And, and it's the opposite of what the, this peaceful and quiet life is. It's also the opposite of the life that the false teachers are demonstrating and leading. They're... They're leading lives that are loud and chaotic and, and disruptive and ungodly and undignified. And that, that's what the false teachers are doing. And so we don't want to follow that. And so we, we pray for everyone. We pray for our, our, our leaders, our kings. We pray for everyone that is in authority. And we pray for fellow Christians that we would lead these lives that are dignified, that are godly. And we pray that we live in a country and we pray for our leaders that they would Make it so that that is easier, so that we can share the gospel. So we're to pray in this way. In verse 3, Paul says, this is good. Why is it good? Because it pleases God. It's pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior. And this pleases God because prayer is the primary way through which we demonstrate our love and dependence on God. It's, it's the primary way we say, God, I need you. <laughs> And I trust that you, above everybody else, are the one I need more 
more than anything. So I'm going to pray to God before I do anything else. It pleases God because it's coming to him and asking for help. This is one of those things I just understand more now that I'm, that I'm a parent. <laughs> Some, you you want to let your kids make mistakes. You want, especially the older they get, you want to give them more freedom. And sometimes you can just see, like, you're just doing that wrong. <laughs> But how, much, how great is it when they come and say, hey, Dad, could you help me? Could you give me some advice on this? Because it shows they trust you, right? And they love you. And it's the same as we think about going to God. Why are we to lead these peaceful and quiet lives? Because in verse 4, God our Savior desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. All people even includes those kings, those presidents, those governors, those mayors congressmen our prayers again are not to be focused on our comfort but on the gospel so we pray that god's kingdom would come that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven and his primary thing is he desires all men to be saved so we pray that people would come to salvation in jesus christ and the more you dislike someone the more you should pray for their salvation because we're commanded to pray for all people and it's sometimes hard to pay for, pray for people that frustrate you. But if they frustrate us, we should pray more. First and foremost, we pray for their salvation. Again, verse 15, the saying is trustworthy in deserving a full acceptance that, Christ, that Jesus Christ came in the world to save sinners. And then here, God our Savior desires that all people to, all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. Pray for salvation and pray for godly wisdom. We're to pray for everybody. We are to be a people of prayer. We're to live life together in an attitude, in a context of praying for one another. And this is how we're we're to live. And so I would just challenge you. It's so easy in Christian church, Christian churches in in church in general here when somebody comes and says, hey, this is what's going on. Just say, hey, I, I will pray for you. And I hope you will. And I know most of you do. And I have a tendency sometimes to, to forget. <laughs> and so sometimes it's just best to go, hey, can I pray for you right now? Because I don't know if I'll remember tomorrow. So can I pray for you now? But we want to be a people that prays for one another. And that's part of why I like this idea of the windows, is you can write the names up there. And as you go by and you see those names, or maybe you see somebody writing a name up there, you're like, hey, who is that? Can I help pray for them? We should be a people that prays together. The second thing is that we're to worship. So we worship through prayer, number one. Number two, we worship through Jesus. In verse five, it says, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. Our ability to worship is tied to our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why we're here, is because through Christ, we have a relationship with God. And if, and there are many people that say they worship God, but they deny Jesus. And if You say you're worshiping God, but you deny Jesus. You're not worshiping the God of the Bible. You're not worshiping the God. You're not worshiping God the way he has revealed himself to us. What is truth? Verse 5, there is one God, only one. And there is one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. A mediator is a go-between or someone that gives you access to someone or some place. Um, I got to shag balls one time at a minor league baseball game in Lancaster, California for the Jet Hawks. And that's not something that you just walk up and say, hey, can I do this? But I had a mediator. My friend was on the team and he went to the manager and said, hey, do you mind if my buddy comes out during batting practice and just stands in the outfield and gets balls? And the manager said, well, he hurt himself or embarrassed me. And my friend said, probably not. (laughs) Um, so they let me, I, I, I got the uniform and I went out there and, and it was because I had a mediator that gave me access to the field that I would not normally have. How did Jesus mediate for us? Well, he became a ransom for all. He died on a cross to save us for our sins. He, was, he paid the price. He, he suffered the wrath that we owe Jesus gave his life to give us access to God, to wash us, to cleanse us. I couldn't go on the field dressed in my street clothes, and I had to put on a Jet Hawks uniform, 
we can't come to God dressed in the clothing of our sin and rebellion. We have to ask Jesus to forgive us and wash us and cleanse us and give us his righteousness to put on. And in his grace and his mercy, he does that. In his mercy, he forgives us. In his grace, he gives us his righteousness to put on. It's through Jesus Christ that we have access to God. It's through Jesus Christ that our sins are forgiven. It's through Jesus Christ that we're transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. There's only one mediator. There's only one way to God, and it's Jesus Christ. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's only one way to God, and that's Jesus Christ. He's the one that gives us access to God. Let me make a little Trinitarian comment here. There's one God, right? Jesus is God. He's the means through which we gain access to himself. Jesus is not a third-party mediator. He is God himself. And and why I point that out is because I think it, it adds depth to that phrase, he was a ransom for us. God didn't outsource salvation. God didn't say, hey, those people need to be saved. I'll hire this outside company or I'll get this other thing to come and do the work. God himself did the work. Jesus Christ came, became a man, lived a holy life, in the greatest act of injustice ever was crucified for us. Paul says that he's both the just and the justifier. That's amazing. Jesus Christ became a ransom for us. And I love that just because it just reminds me, whenever you doubt God's love, just look at the cross and think, how could I doubt he loved me? He died for me. How will he not graciously give us all things? So Jesus Christ is is the mediator. He's the means through which we are forgiven. And so we worship through Christ. And Paul is excited. He says, verse 7, for this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. He says, this is is the message I have. This, This is what I am preaching. This is what I want you to know. This is what I want the church to love. Jesus Christ came. And then he adds that phrase in there, I am telling the truth, I'm not lying, because there are some people, again, those false teachers that were going, yeah, that Paul guy, he's a little off, you know, this isn't really what God meant. But Paul says, this is the truth. And he's teaching, and he's teaching everybody, Jews and Gentiles. So Paul's commands in leading this chaotic church in Ephesus that is this being attacked are worship through prayer and worship through Jesus Christ. Hold fast to who Jesus Christ is. And then the third thing here in verses 9 through 15 is worship through humility. That our worship is to be characterized by humility. The state of the church in Ephesus, again, was, was confused by many people claiming to be teachers. And the gospel was being compu- confused by people who who were just lost in in an ocean of speculation. And pride was running rampant through the church. It's different. People tried to form coalitions and get my group together. And if I can get my group together and you get your group together, maybe we can run this thing. And Paul is just saying no. The church is to be about Jesus Christ It's grounded and rooted in who he is, and it's rooted in prayer. And so when you come to worship, you have to lay aside your selfishness and your self-promotion. We're to worship through humility. So verse 8, how how are men, how what does it look like when men are worshiping in humility? Men in in our pride, we, we like to brag about our exploits. We like to fight and quarrel when conflict come around. Uh, The stereotype of men is that there's a tendency to want to dominate through physical power and prowess. And um, that stereotype comes around because in a lot of cases that's true. I just, I think back to recess on the playground when I was a kid and we played football and Red Rover and 
I mean, that, that was my group of friends because that's just, we just basically tried to kill each other every recess. And if no, you know, in high school when I played basketball, if one of us wasn't bleeding, you know, we hadn't finished the game, nose, lip, something. And there was just this power thing. And then we would brag after recess about how we did. Worship is not to be a place where we, we promote our, our prowess, guys. It, it's not a place where we build our own image and our own manliness. And, and even as I say those things, there, there's that tendency to be like, yeah, I was the one that won the football games. I mean, that's just kind of who it, but that's, that's not what we're to be about here at church, right? We're not to be self-promoting in this. So what, what do men who are worshiping humility do? Men worshiping in humility pray. Paul says, I desire that in every place men should pray. And notice he says, in every place. Guys, we're to be men of prayer. And, and it's hard, again, because as men, we so much want to be in control of things. And we so much want to say, I've got this. It's so hard to ask for help. But we're to be men that pray. We're to be men that are dependent on God. We're to be men that just say, God, I, life is hard. This world is tough. I need your help. Help me. And he has promised that he will. When we draw what Rob read um, at the beginning of service, when we draw near to the throne of grace, we will find mercy and help to find, mercy and grace to help in time of need. We're to be men that pray. And then men worshiping in humility lift up holy hands. We're to pray lifting up holy hands. This is not talking about the position that your body is in when you pray. It doesn't mean that you have to pray like this. Think back more to when you were a child and you would come to the dinner table and your mom would say, show me your hands. What was she doing? She was checking for cleanliness, right? And if you boldly said, here... And she said, turn them over. There you go. It's this idea of, of coming boldly and lifting up those hands and saying, check for the cleanliness. Versus when mom says, show me your hands. And you're like, oh, no, I washed them. <laughs> Let me see your hands. Oh, mom, I washed them. Show me. It's that idea of, of coming, to, to, coming to prayer, lifting up holy hands, be, being holy in your actions, not just coming to prayer and praying, saying, God, I need your help, but living a life that is consistent with the following of Christ. And he says, without anger or quarreling. We're not to, we're not to come angry about things and quarreling and, and ready for a fight. And again, think about this, this church in Ephesus. There's just chaos in the church. And I don't know if you've ever been a part of a church like that. It, it can be frustrating. You come and rather than on your way to church, you're thinking about how am I going, what am I going to learn about God and how am I going to encourage one another? You're thinking about, well, how am I going to get so-and-so today? How am I going to battle him? How am I going to establish my position? That's not what the church is to be. We're not to be about quarreling and anger. That's pride. It's arrogance. It's wanting to promote our own prowess and not God's glory. It's wanting people to follow us rather than follow God. That's not who we're to be. We're to worship in humility, praying, letting our lives match who Jesus Christ is. And when conflict comes, rather than getting angry and quarreling about it, we're humble and we treat other people with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's how we worship in humility. Then Paul, in verse 9 turns to women. He says, likewise also. So in the, in the same way, in the same idea of, of coming together. So I, I think, again, there's that dependence on God. There's that, there's that, excuse me, need to pray. But I think guys are just have a harder time, so I think he throws that in specifically with the guys. But he says in verse 9, women worshiping in humility adorn themselves well. 
Verse 9, likewise also women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control. So women are to adorn themselves in respectable apparel. It's, it's things that are modest. Sabina was doing a talk on modesty and found this quote. I don't remember who said it, but modest, it defines modesty in this way. Modesty is humility expressed in dress. Modesty is, is humility expressed in dress. I like that definition a lot because too often we, we describe or we define modesty in, in inches. If the shorts are longer or they're not enough inches or the skirt is longer or, or whatever, but, but really modesty is more a, a heart issue. Modesty is dressing in a way that doesn't draw extraordinary attention to yourself. It's good to dress nice. You should want to dress nice. But if you came in here wearing like a, a, a ball gown, be like, okay, that's a little inappropriate for church. And not that it's immodest, but you're trying to draw attention to yourself. And in the same way, if you went back, to, was the 90s grunge? If you went back to the 90s and dressed grunge, you know, people would be like, that's not really appropriate for church. So it's this, this idea of you're dressing in a way that's um, drawing attention to yourself. And, and he describes what is immodest. He says that it's braiding of hair, or gold or pearls, or costly attire. And there's two things in, in, in mind here. Um, one is hairstyles and clothing that, were, that would not be proper for a woman who is professing godliness to wear. And just to kind of sum that up, don't dress like a lady of low morals who's trying to catch a man. Is that a good way to put that? Just, you want to come to church and, and have people focusing on God. You're not trying to draw attention to yourself. And then the second thing is just the, the overly obvious show of wealth. And so women back then would braid gold and pearls into their hair and, and really wear really expensive clothing and just come in and be like, I want people to know how rich I am. I ran in, just got into this random conversation in a coffee shop this week and uh, talking to the guy I've never met before. And um, we're just standing there talking, and I don't remember how we got, but he was like, oh, yeah, this, this watch, I just wear it because it was a gift. You know, it's a really, and he just started going on and on about how expensive his watch was and his clothing and how he's really modest, but kept pointing out how expensive everything was. And I was just kind of like, okay. Um, that, that, that's what Paul has in mind here is, is it's coming to church in, in a humble adornment that isn't trying to draw attention to yourself. That's not why you come. That's not what you should think about in, in your dress. What is it that you're to, to adorn yourself with? Well, it's good works. Let, let your character, let your beauty be who you are in the way that you treat one another, in the way that you love one another, not simply in how you dress. So there's a humility in the way that you adorn yourself. And then you come to verse... 11. And I, would, I title this, Women Worshiping in Humility Seek God. Worship is to be prayerful. It's to be free from the combativeness that is described up in verse 8. Um, and, the preoccupa and, and it's to be free from the preoccupation of, appear of appearance. Like, I would hate it if, if women just were so preoccupied about what they looked like that they spent hours you know, getting ready for church because I don't want, you know, so-and-so to think whatever. I, th those things should be free as we gather in worship. So Paul says in verse 11, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. In Ephesus, and in that time, it was common for men and women to be separated for, for worship. It was common for them to be separated uh, for education. And Paul here, as he's saying, in the church... We expect women to learn. Women are just as much followers and disciples of Jesus Christ as the men are. And so there's an expectation. So this isn't a let a woman as in, a, as in, in um, limiting her ability to learn. It's expanding it. Like let her come and sit. And let her come and sit quietly with all submissiveness. She's a disciple as well. She's not relegated to something less. She's to learn and follow as well. 
He's not saying, well, if she wants to learn, let her come in. He's, like, he's saying, no, you should promote a, an environment in which she can learn and learn well. She's quiet and submissive because she's excited and ready to learn. Do you ever have that kid in class that in class they'd be like, be quiet, I'm trying to learn. And you're like, you're a nerd. <laughs> Right, you're like, we didn't like that kid. They're the kid that scored best on, well, you might have been that kid, but you know, for so many of us, we're like, we don't want to learn. We want to goof off in class. And the picture here is of this, this woman that is coming to church, and she's like, I just want to be somewhere where I can sit and not have the chaos of, you know, ver- again, verse 8, these men that are fighting and quarreling, or verse 9, these women that are so wrapped up in their appearance. I don't want all of that. I want to come and sit and learn. I want to learn well. Her attitude, her desire is to soak up God's word, to humbly hear and conform herself to Jesus Christ, to seek and know who Christ is. The Living Translation does a great job here. It says, let a woman receive training in a quiet demeanor with complete respect for order. And I, and I love this verse because as I, as I look around, as I know you, this is who you guys are. This is who our church is as a whole. Is I think we, we come together and we want to hear God's word. We want to be taught. We want to grow. It's the humble attitude to... the. You're to come to worship with it. And again, men too. But for Ephesus, because of the chaos, he just needed to lay it out clearly. Like, as you come together in worship, the goal is to know and understand who God is. And we're not going to segregate people out, and we're going to let the women learn as well. In chapter 3, Paul's going to go on, and he's going to... Um, lay out the qualifications for pastors, for, for overseers, for, for elders. And those are synonyms that are interchangeable. And knowing that that is coming, Paul makes a clarifying statement here in verse 12. He says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. And so he puts two limits or excuses women from two activities in the church. He's not allowed to teach, and they're not allowed to exercise spiritual oversight. And some will take this too far, and I've had these conversations, and I had someone tell me that, that any time a woman speaks, she's communicating information, and therefore she is teaching with authority. And so once women enter the building, they should not be allowed to speak. <laughs> My wife started laughing right away. That, that's, that's taking it too far. That's not what he has in, in mind here. What has he had in mind the, the entire book so far? What has he had in mind in, in this letter? What will he lay out in chapter 3 as he lays out who's to lead? Paul is talking about the leadership of the church, the, the people that is responsible for the shepherding, for the nurturing of the church are the pastors and and elders and overseers that he's going to describe in chapter 3. They're the ones that are responsible for the care of the church. What is the primary way through which they do that? It's through the teaching of God's word. We exercise authority as pastors when we preach God's word. In all honesty, we don't have much authority outside of that. I can't dock your paycheck. I can't fire you. I can't say I'm going to give you less hours. Whatever, you know, bosses would use. The only thing we have is this is what God says. Please hold fast to it. And we do. And there are some... You know, within, within the membership of the church, we recognize who is a member. And there are sometimes times where we say, you know, you're not walking in consistency with God, who God is. And so we as a church put them out. But the authority that the leader, that the pastors, the elders, the overseers have is the preaching of God's word. And so Paul limits that to men. The pillar, the pillar commentary paraphrases these verses this way. It says, let a woman at worship... Concentrate quietly, quietly on her calling as a discipline. Let me start over. I'm a lot tongue tied today. A lot. Let a woman at worship concentrate quietly on her calling as a disciple to learn, fully intent on what God has to teach her. 
That is to say, I do not want the woman, that woman to teach and exercise oversight over a man. That is your job as pastoral leader, Timothy, as well as men whom you and the church vet and appoint. But as I said, to have a quiet space for learning preserved for them when she is at worship. And so again, the idea here is that women worshiping in humility have this desire to learn. And then Paul says, and the, the teaching and authority is set aside for the pastors, the elders, the overseers. Why is this position of pastor and elder given to men? Paul tells us in verse 13. And notice that he doesn't ground this argument in, in culture, his opinion, or, or pragmatism. He grounds it in creation, the creation order. He says in verse 13, For Adam was formed first, then Eve. By order of creation, Adam was the head of that family. Adam and Eve were both created in the image of God, so their worth and identity were the same. They were both given the same charge to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth, to subdue it, to have dominion over it. However, God did create them differently. At the most basic level, be fruitful and multiply. Only men can be fathers and only women can be mothers. No matter what our society says. (laughs) Right? So so there are differences. They're created to complement one another and to fulfill the task together. So Paul says, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. And then he says... And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. A clear translation would actually be Adam was not deceived first. And I think God is not piling on Eve here because he's very clear in other places. And Paul is very clear in Romans 5, 12 and 14 that death came to the world through Adam. It's Adam's sin through which Everyone after became a sinner. So he's not piling on here, but I think we get an example where Adam wasn't leading like he should have. And, and, and he let Eve be deceived. And I even, I even heard, um, I was listening to one uh, sermon this week, and the guy even said, he goes, I think the ideal would have been when Eve sinned for Adam to, stand, to step up and say, I will take, God, whatever punishment you have laid on her, I will take in her place. And I like that because it made me think of Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave gave himself up for her. I've never heard anybody else say that, but I was like, "That's that's a really interesting thought. That's not what happened, so we don't know. But Adam followed the lead of Eve and they both fell into sin and we all became transgressors. So again, I don't think he's piling on Eve here. He's just describing what happened. Is that they, they blew it and Adam wasn't leading in the way that he should. And then you get to verse 15 and it says, yet she shall be saved through childbearing. And some people think that this is pointing forward to Christ and that Um, Christ would come through woman, which is true. But I think Paul's mind is still in Genesis. And then that's what he's talking about, right? He's talking about Adam and Eve. He's talking about Genesis 1 through 3. And I don't think there's a reason, I don't think he has shifted from that. What was the command given to Adam and Eve? What were they called to do? They were called to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth, to subdue it, to have dominion. And so when Paul says she will be saved through childbearing, I think he's simply saying if she had just done what God called her to do, if Adam and Eve had done what they were supposed to do, then they would have been saved. They would have been fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. This is not in any way saying that you're saved by having children. He's just pointing out that we're saved as we obey God. A woman is saved as she sticks to her, to, to God's design for her in creation. 
Men, we are saved as we stick to God's design for us in creation. And what is the first and foremost part of our design is that we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So God's design for us in creation, first and foremost, is that we follow him, that we put our faith in him, that we repent of our sins, and then we are saved. But Paul very clearly here has given this this restriction. Woman's not to teach or exercise authority, and he grounds that in creation, in Adam and Eve. And then he finishes the sentence by saying, if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. So he goes back to to worship, to, to life together. How are we saved? We place our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. What does that look like as it plays out in our life? So we're saved, and then we move into this period of growing to be like Christ, being sanctified, looking more and more like him every day until we finally die, and, and he fixes everything. But what does that look like? She continues in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Because that's how a worship That's how a woman worships well in humility, is through faith, love, holiness, and self-control. We've covered a lot today. I know there are probably a ton of questions out there. Um, But I wanted you to hear the whole paragraph in context, because too many times we we take it apart and we take just a verse or here, but I wanted you to hear Paul's heart in, in all of this is that we live together well. This chapter is about life together. It's about worship. How do we come together? And we come together because of Jesus Christ in prayer and humility. We don't gather to draw glory for ourselves. We don't gather to build a name for ourselves. We gather to glorify Christ, sing his praises, and glorify his name. We are a body. The church is described as a body of Christ. And the body is only healthy and grows in strength as each member participates and fulfills their purpose. A foot can't say, I want to be an eye. So let's live together well. Let's live together in prayer and humility, trusting and depending on Jesus Christ in all things. All right? Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for Paul's heart and care for the church and for every member of it. And Lord, we know that your desire is to glorify your name and your desire is for us to do well, to live well, to reflect who you are well. And God, I pray that you would grow us in our prayer lives, Lord. God, I pray that you would grow us in our dependence on you. And God, I pray that you would grow us in our humility to follow you well, to love one another, and to love the world outside, Lord. God, we pray that you would work in a mighty way through us to continue to build your kingdom to save sinners. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing one more song. Um, While the band comes, just take a few moments and talk with the Lord. Uh, There will be some of us up here. If you'd like to pray with someone or have any questions, uh, we'd love to talk with you. All right? Oh, would you guys stand with us as we sing one more song together?
Let me close our time by reading from the very next chapter in 1 Timothy, where Paul writes that he wrote, writes this, everything in this sermon series we've been studying, that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. So therefore, let us confess the mystery of godliness, that he was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Amen.